Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Quasi Cyber Seminar at Ruth Force Conference Hall. My name is Latrice, and I will be your coordinator for today. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. We will be facilitating a question and answer session towards the end of this call. If you require operator assistance, please press star followed by zero, and a coordinator will be happy to assist you. At this time, I would like to turn the hand. I would like to hand the presentation over to your host for today's call, Mr. David Kirschel, Program Manager of Quasi. Please proceed. Thank you. Good afternoon, and welcome to the third in the um, Fall uh, 2008 Cyber Seminar Series. Um, today's speaker is Ed Edward Rutherford, who is now with uh, NOAA Great Lakes Research Lab in Ann Arbor, and uh, will be speaking momentarily. Um, before we get started, uh, just a couple of announcements. Um, if you have problems today, please you can use the chat or you can contact the operators directly. Uh, and also, we'd appreciate feedback, good, bad, or otherwise, uh, to be sent to commanager at kawasi.org. And sometime around in the presentation, both audio and video will be available on the Kawasi website um, for you to use and or review or let other folks know what's going on. Um, some upcoming events. Um, the, the final seminar for the fall series will be next Friday by Aris Perdukakos from Georgia Tech. Um, same time, same same bat channel. Uh, see, and also to remind you that we now have a time and place for the quasi membership meeting and reception at Fall ADU. It will be Tuesday on 16 December at 6:30, and we will be at the Grand Hyatt Hotel up on the 36th floor with a nice view. So please join us. All right. Today's presentation is um, by Edward Rutherford, now of the uh, NOAA Great Lakes Lab in Ann Arbor, and he will be talking about the Great Lakes Cooperative Institute for Limnology and Ecosystem Research, Program Overview, Hydrology, Research, and Applications. And I will now turn the presentation over to Ed to begin in a second. Okay, Ed, it's all yours. You may begin. Okay, well, thank you very much, David. I first of all want to thank Praveen Kumar and also David Kirstel for inviting me to give you a seminar and talk about uh, hydrologic, uh, hydrology related activities um, in the Great Lakes. Uh, I must confess, first off, that I'm not a hydrologist, um, so forgive that. I'm a fish head. Uh, I've been working for 14 years in the Great Lakes at the University of Michigan School of Natural Resources and Environment. I spent a year and a half as interim director of SILAR, um, which I'll speak about in a second. And then this last summer, I um, accepted a job with NOAA, Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab. One thing I'd like to point out to you, though, is um, the, the working relationships uh, um, between Siler and NOAA, and then the other universities in the Great Lakes are very close. And uh, if nothing else, I'd like you to take that home today. So today, I'd like to tell you about some, some of the resource issues uh, related to hydrology in the Great Lakes. What is a Siler? Uh, what are some of the research themes in NOAA and Siler? Some examples, and then more specific applications of hydrology research within NOAA and um, within SILAR to look at uh, impacts of climate change and land use on natural resources. So what are some of the resource issues that we've been dealing he with here in the Great Lakes? There, if you look at this list, uh, you, you probably would say that similar things about any place in the United States, uh, water diversions, uh, dams, changes in land use, degradation of habitats for aquatic organisms, over-harvest of fishery species, contaminants. In the Great Lakes, uh, although it's not unique here, we have had a slew of invasive species coming in uh, into the, the aquatic ecosystem, which has fundamentally changed the way nutrients and energy are processed in the system. and, and uh, we certainly have been focusing on that for many years. 
And to all of this, we are now adding climate change as is occurring everywhere. The slide on the left shows you a drop in lake level up in northern Lake Michigan, and the, the building in the background right in front of the trees is a lighthouse, which was built on the edge of the water. And uh, due to the warming climate, uh, it's anticipated that lake levels and in the Great Lakes would drop um, approximately a meter, give or take uh, probably a meter in the future. So what is a siler? A siler is a, one of 21 cooperative institutes between uh, NOAA and um, universities. And it's to facilitate uh, research collaborations and add expertise uh, from universities to NOAA's research portfolio. Typically, these cooperative institutes set up agreements uh, that last on the range for, from five to ten years at a time, uh, which then can be renewed through reapplication. The Siler in the Great Lakes, which is a cooperative institute for limnology and ecosystem research, was established in 1989 and originally between University of Michigan, Michigan State, and NOAA. Now, however, uh, through the uh, reapplication of Siler, there are eight different Great Lakes universities which are member partners of Siler. And um, really, it, it, it's open. NOAA is allowed now to work with any of the universities in the Great Lakes um, through this institute. The institute itself, the administration of the institute, is housed within the University of Michigan School of Natural Resources and Environment. The current director of Siler is Dr. Alan Burton, who is an ecotoxicologist from Wright State University who's just joined University of Michigan. Siler's mission is well coordinated with NOAA's mission in the Great Lakes. Um, it's uh, set up to improve the effectiveness of its research, um, serve as a focal point uh, between NOAA and the Great Lakes research community. Uh, education is a critical component of Siler. NOAA's mission is to, uh, or Siler's mission is to train the next generation of NOAA scientists. So there are a number of um, programs, graduate fellowships, uh, summer internships, uh, science bowl uh, contests that are set up to bring, uh, train students and bring them into NOAA. Here's a map showing locations of um, the recent um, Cooperative Institute programs. I think as of last year, there were 21. And, and a list of some of the participating universities. Uh, in the Great Lakes, I want to reiterate, we have eight member partners now. So the research themes for Siler and NOAA, uh, NOAA Great Lakes Lab, are the same. And they're listed here. Um, the invasive species and ecosystem forecasting are pretty much the largest components of the research por portfolio for NOAA and Siler. Uh, I'd say about 70% of its budget is, is uh, allocated through that. Integrated assessments are a new component of Siler and NOAA research, and uh, that adds a social component, uh, economics and policy, into these uh, um, sort of traditional hard science projects. Um, there's observing systems, uh, which we'll talk about in more detail. There's an aspect of habitat protection and, and uh, restoration, as well as the education and outreach. So I'm just going to illustrate a few examples of work in these various research themes and then focus on particular applications in the latter half of my talk. Uh, an example of the Great Lakes forecasting theme is um, an attempt to analyze uh, outbreaks of harmful algal blooms and bacteria in the Great Lakes. With the Great Lakes, is, is, as is true of most estuaries around the country, is very susceptible uh, or seen um, more frequently occurring harmful algal blooms. and. Uh, there are a number of large cities on the Great Lakes, uh, so bacterial contamination of coastal waters is, is quite a problem in some areas. 
And so the um, limnologists, the physical limnologists at Blural and Siler are developing uh, or have developed hydrodynamic models to forecast the um, transport of bacteria uh, in the water column and, and the transport of harmful algal blooms. And the, the model um, used for this is a um, Princeton Ocean model and um, with a one, in the near shore zone with a one kilometer, uh, excuse me, I think it's maybe a hundred meter uh, resolution scale. Integrated assessments are, which include some component of policy in them, are also a key uh, research theme in, in Siler and NOAA. And a nice example of this is a project called Ecofor, which is, e uh, the project is to assess the causes and consequences of hypoxic areas in Lake Erie and uh, suggest management solutions. If you look at the, um, I'll move my pointer over. I guess that. You look at that. Uh, Ed? Yes. Your pointer is not showing up. Okay, sorry. Uh, let's see. Well, if you look at the box on the lower right hand side, which is labeled 2005 and has four panels with outlines of Lake Erie with color in them. Uh, you can see an area, uh, and the color indicates various concentrations of dissolved oxygen in the water column. And these are um, bottom oxygen concentrations. And you can see that through the summer, um, the co oxygen concentration uh, becomes lower and lower until practically the whole central basin of Lake Erie becomes uh, the bottom layers become hypoxic or anoxic. And uh, there have been a number of field studies and modeling work lately to look at the implications of developing hypoxia on the food web and fisheries. Towards that end, uh, there's a large effort to understand what's causing hypoxia, and it's clearly related to nutrient input from the watersheds. So you can see in the lower left-hand panel, uh, an image of uh, model simulated concentrations of phosphorus that are uh, coming out of the Maumee River watershed, which is the largest watershed draining into Lake Erie uh, in the Western Basin. And that um, is what is believed to stimulate the um, phytoplankton and harmful algal blooms that subsequently lead to oxygen depletion in the lower uh, layers of the water column. Another aspect of Siler research is observing systems, and this is basically developing uh, technology in situ uh, continuous measurements of uh, physical and biological um, variables to help to aid in ecosystem forecasting. And so this is just a diagram to illustrate how these things might, might work in concept. Uh, you can see a buoy located offshore uh, with environmental se sensors anchored in the water column that then information gets transmitted to shore and is uh, available um, on land to scientists on land. There are a couple of these buoys um, set up already in the Great Lakes, and uh, I'll show you a map in just a second. Uh, but some of the applications of this technology is to analyze and, and predict rip currents, uh, hypoxia, look at when fish are spawning on, on reefs uh, at various locations around the, the, the lakes, ice studies, tabs, and uh, here's some of the locations of these fixed and buoys. Um, there are some in three of the Great Lakes and their plans to pending funding to expand that network. Uh, now, what some of that information is used for is to predict, um, now, develop nowcasts and forecasts of currents and lake levels. And so here's a um, an image showing the 
the Lake St. Clair, which is the large water body that sits between the bottom of Lake Huron and the, le we the west end of Lake Erie. And it shows the um, average currents and, and lake levels over a 48-hour period. Now, applications of these of this technology and models for specific, um, more specific issues is, is following. Um, I'm going to give two examples. One is for a watershed called the Muskegon River watershed that drains into Lake Michigan. It's in the lower peninsula of Michigan. And uh, the outline of the watershed is shown in a panel in the upper left hand uh, part of the graph. And um, I just want to focus your attention on that panel for a second. Uh, what you can see is a change in um, land use is what is depicted here, a change in land use from the 1800s all the way to the present, to 2006. And basically, you see a change in green color, which indicates forested areas, uh, to yellow, which is farmland, and then a change from farmland back to forest in green, but also in the you know, right near the blue area where the watershed meets the, the lake is, is the city of Muskegon. So in trends of increasing urbanization and reforestation in the watershed, up through the present. And then the question is, how will that uh, trend in future, um, given people's choices about where to develop in the watershed, how will that influence the resources in, in the watershed? Uh, combined with those patterns in land use, we have changes in climate, as uh, we're all aware of. And uh, got a few slides here showing long-term trends in temperature, and in precipitation, in our area of the, of the country, uh, the levels of precipitation have been increasing over time. And they are predicted to continue to increase under uh, various scenarios of climate change. So we're, in, we're expecting to have a warmer but wetter climate on top of uh, increasing patterns in land use. And the question is, what does this mean for natural resources in the um, watershed, and what can people do to um, mitigate the impacts of, these, of development and climate change. So to, to answer those questions, uh, a number of scientists um, that are affiliated with uh, or have worked with Seiler and NOAA, but based at a number of Great Lakes universities are working together uh, using sort of state-of-the-art uh, hydrologic modeling tools to get at that question. Um, so here's a cartoon showing various models that are coupled together, that actually talk to each other. The input, the outputs of one model serve as inputs to another model. But we have social um, land use models, the LTM2 on the upper part of that graph. Uh, then we have, there's climate models not depicted. Um, there's uh, groundwater models, surface uh, channel models, um, hydraulic models, which then feed into a suite of uh, water chemistry models, and finally, bug and macroinvertebrate and fish models. To develop the input, the, uh, the measurements that were used to uh, calibrate the models, an extensive uh, sampling program was conducted in the watershed. And here it's here depicted as a, a DEM map of the Lower Peninsula of Michigan. And the outline of the Muskegon River watershed is, is outlined there. Um, so a lot of data were collected over uh, several years from approximately 2000 to 2004 uh, to calibrate these models. And then a lot of other information was brought in from other watersheds around the state, uh, both on hydrology, on uh, temperature, and 
fish and macroinvertebrate distributions. Uh, to to develop um, static models, regression-based models, as well as dynamic models. And an example of this is something that probably some of you are familiar with, uh, coupling uh, HECRAS uh, models to a, a very simplistic but sometimes powerful um, models of habitat suitability for various organisms. So, um, for example, we, if you can look, it allows uh, us to look at the effects of changes in flow on habitat suitability for walleye or steelhead or Chinook salmon or, or another species of interest. So uh, in this figure are summarized some of the results. And this figure is a busy figure, but I'll try and walk you through it. Um, on the y-axis is indicated um, the present uh, case um, and, and then a percentage change from the percentage case. Uh, then on the x-axis are three different land use type scenarios. One is called Farm LP, and uh, that is a modified version of land use where um, the current amount of farmland is um, is is allowed to go to um, forest and with a little bit lower um, rate of, of urban uh, urban sprawl. On the far right, uh, where it says red urban sprawl, is a, a simulation that looks at assuming a reduced level of urban uh, urban sprawl and letting farmland going back to um, forest. And then a third scenario is called business as usual, BA usual, which is the current rate of urbanization and the current rate of allowing farmland go back to um, the forest. And the variables depicted here are the rate of sedimentation change from present, the rate of flow change from present, and the summer temperature change from present under the current climate and climate change. And it will take a long time to sort of parse out the information here, but the, the, ba the basic points I'd like to make is, is that we're getting different predictions about um, the change from current conditions in the sediment delivery, the flow, and the temperature, depending on the land use scenario that people want to adopt. If we want to be conservative, we end up with a, uh, and protect the resources, we end up with a um, scenario that's depicted on the um, far right-hand side with, with fairly minimal increase in sediment and flow and minimal increase in, in summer temperature from the present. Um, if we, and, and therefore, um, there's not much you can do about the climate change, but the end use change effects are minimized. If you look on the left hand side, um, we see um, a big difference from present, from present in summer temperature, flow, and sediment delivery, and this is kind of the worst case scenario. So what does this mean for fish, which you guys may not care about, but but I do. I'm a fish head. Uh, on the x-axis is depicted the percent change in habitat suitability, which was uh, developed by predicting the um, change in hydrologic conditions, which then changed the the, the preferences for fish for that particular habitat in a watershed. And on the y-axis is depicted different groups of fish, uh, walleye, uh, stream trout, smallmouth bass, largemouth bass, northern pike, um, uh, sort of a group of cold water fishes together, and migrating salmonids, which means Chinook salmon and steelhead. And the middle black line on the x-axis is zero change from present. And there are two points to make. Under a climate change, um, 
The cold water fishes, the trout, the cold water group, and the migrating salmonids are all going to do a lot worse under climate change simply because the the water is going to heat up, and um, they are they prefer cold water. The winners in a climate change scenario are the bass and the pike. Um, but what's interesting about these scenarios is that uh, land use practices, at least for the fish, this is not true for macroinvertebrates, but at least for fish, land use different land use practices don't have as much of an influence as climate change does. So that's the end of sort of a watershed-specific analysis of uh, applying hydrology modeling tools to predict changes in natural resources. The next section is a detailed look at the hydrology program at NOAA Great Lakes Lab, which was really developed by Tom Crowley, who is uh, actually retiring from our program. And there, NOAA is looking for a new hydrologist. So if any of you are interested in coming to Ann Arbor and working, please apply. <laughs> uh, but Tom has developed quite a, quite a hydrology program, which is integrated um, with Siler. Uh, he has uh, something called an advanced hydrology prediction system uh, and a distributed large basin runoff model for and these are the differences in these two uh, systems or programs are one of scale. Um, the A HIPS, as he calls it, is for predicting changes in in the Great Lakes themselves, um, and it's sort of a lump model uh, for the whole Great Lakes. The DLBRM, uh, the, the distributed model, is specific to a uh, to a watershed. Okay, so um, this is a um, set of slides showing a uh, calibrated uh, large basin runoff model, but which um, takes water, um, runs it through snowpack, through very uh, precipitation, um, through various um, components or categories and ends up with a prediction um, into the lakes uh, and for lake levels. This is a diagram of the components of the, uh, the hydrology prediction system. Um, the river, the large basin runoff model is just a component of that, and that's shown up in the upper left-hand corner. Then um, there are other models that uh, model lake precipitation that move water, uh, hydraulic models that w move water through uh, channels connecting the Great Lakes. Uh, there's a management component. There's a heat model, water ba balance component. And the, um, the outputs or predictions are um, listed down below in yellow and in red for looking at effects of climate change for doing near-term and longer-term forecasts. These are um, probabilistic weather forecasts um, that developed for both the U.S. and for Canada. Um, these are, there are weights applied to these forecasts um, and then run through the models to give um, the most probable hydrologic uh, forecast. So an example of the output from the um, large basin model is shown here. This is a forecast or, or prediction of what the Lake Superior mean lake level is in meters uh, over the last um, year. And as you can see, um, it, and, and, and it's a probabilistic forecast, so as you can see, it, it generally behaves pretty well. So the next slide shows um, the basin response 
Um, the, his model can predict a uh, number of variables um, throughout the Great Lakes as a response of, in response to predictions from climate models. And the climate models here that were used were both the Canadian models and the Hadley II climate models. Um, the base case was um, based on climate information over the last 60 to 100 years, and that's shown in the upper left-hand corner. And then the various scenarios, and I um, don't have the notes on which ones are which, but the various climate scenarios are shown in the subsequent panels, warm and dry predictions, cool and dry, this is in the future, warm and wet, and cool and wet. And the uh, response variable is the, the amount of runoff entering into the, the lakes. Uh, he also predicts the surface temperature, uh, evapotranspiration, evaporation, which is shown here. And uh, the um, the final output is the uh, net basin supply to each lake, which is the sum of precipitation over the lake surface and runoff from all the surrounding watersheds minus lake evaporation. So um, the nice it's a it's it's a uh, nice system in that it gives a general ballpark figure for what's going to happen. Uh, what might happen under climate change. And here's a summary of the model predictions from that modeling system. That in the future we expect higher air te temperatures uh, with higher evapotranspiration and lower runoff. Earlier runoff peaks, uh, reduced soil moisture, higher water temperatures, uh, more heat in the deep lakes, with, uh, which will lead to diminished mixing of the lakes, reduced ice formation, and increased evaporation. Uh, so even though there's more precipitation, the net supply of water should is expected to drop uh, for the for Lake Superior, uh, for Lake Michigan, Lake Huron, um, and for for Lake Erie and Lake Ontario, except under a cool and wet scenario. Uh, one other thing that Tom wanted me to mention, which was an interesting application of this um, large basin runoff model, was um, some paleolimnologists had discovered that um, there were terminal la lakes in the Great Lakes about 7,000 years ago, and they discovered this through radiocarbon dating of um, sediments in the lake. And uh, so they wanted uh, what that was a function of, and they asked uh, Tom to to try and use his large basin runoff model to predict that. Uh, and so here are plots of what water levels will be in Lake Superior and in Lake Michigan. And the axes here are the percent precipitation drop on the x-axis and the percent increase in temperature. And basically, if you follow the uh, isocline, uh, isoclines to the right, starting at the origin and moving uh, to the right in each case, you will see with increasing precipitation, uh, I mean an increased drop in precipitation, so less precipitation and increased warming, at some point you, you find the um, terminal you find the formation of these terminal moraines. And so Tom was able to describe the conditions under which that that might have occurred. So a more specific watershed specific application of uh, Tom's hy um, hydrology program is, is shown next. And he calls this a distributed large basin runoff model, um, but it's really developed for specific watersheds. And uh, each watershed is divided in, into grids of one kilometer by one kilometer. And water and nutrients and pollutants are moved 
uh, horizontally according to difference in elevation. Um, this is a schematic to show the, the flow of water and all the, the, uh, the um, compartments in which it's tracked. Um, and I know you all are much more familiar with this than I, so I will skip over it. Um, but uh, here's a, and, and they've used this to, to look at the fate of nutrients and contaminants like mercury uh, in watersheds over the last uh, five, ten years. It's a more recent development. But um, this is a really nice both slide and an application, I think. Um, what this shows is a, the um, distribution of uh, potential sources from within a watershed of what is actually what was actually measured at the output. And um, so on the left is a, a watershed, I think, for the Maumee River watershed draining into western Lake Erie. And it shows that where was the um, water or nutrients or contaminants, where was it located um, one day before it was found at the outlet? And the highlighted areas indicate the sources of the, of the water or nutrients that was found um, the day after at the outlet draining into Lake Michigan. So you can follow that back any period of time you want. And, and the slide on the right shows that, um, showing the location of nutrients or water that was what, 31 days before it showed up at the outlet. And so this is very useful in management and indicating what parts of the watershed are contributing uh, more to uh, eutrophication in Lake Erie than, than other areas. Well, um, nutrients coming off the landscape is not necessarily a bad thing, and actually um, it's been shown through statistical relationships that uh, delivery of water and phosphorus from the Maumee River watershed into western basin of Lake Erie is positively correlated with production of young yellow perch. And yellow perch is, is a, a prized sport and commercial fish harvested in Lake Erie, shown on the left. And uh, this is a relationship that's been developed over years of um, collecting data. Um, the DLBRM uh, image for Maumee River watershed is shown in the lower right. And the western basin of Lake Erie is shown to the right. And that's a satellite image. And you can see the um, area of turbidity extending from the Maumee River Basin. And uh, that actually is where most of the young yellow perch and the young walleye that are produced in, in the whole lake, that they are spawned and and thrive in that area. And it's not clear why that is. Um, we think it's due to higher zooplankton production, but it's also clearly due to just the benefit of um, increased turbidity. The body of water that's entering up in the north part of western Lake Erie is, is, the, in, is the output outflow from the Detroit River, which drains um, Lake Huron. That's a colder clearer um, and has a lot lower nutrient level. So um, it's really nice to be able to use these hydrologic models to the tie into production of lower trophic levels in fisheries. A final application of uh, Tom's uh, distributed large basin runoff model is shown here. And this is, um, he's developed these DLBRMs for specific watersheds. Um, in this example, he's shown uh, what is used for, for the Grand River watershed that drains into western Lake Michigan, or into eastern Lake Michigan. It, the Grand River is the largest watershed in Michigan. And uh, he's developing forecasts for discharge water temperature 
fecal coliform bacteria, sediments, other pollutions, uh, other pollutants. And then once that water is um, put out into the lake, it's tracked by a series of other models by the physical limnologist that I described earlier. We're following the, the advection and, and ultimate fate of that material along the coast uh, to make uh, forecasts for beach closing. So that's the end of my talk, and I appreciate your um, attention. I uh, want to summarize by saying that uh, Siler, the Cooperative Institute, I think provides very effective working relationships between NOAA and universities to uh, help address some of these pressing issues. Uh, and now I will stop and entertain questions. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to ask a question, please press star followed by one on your touchtone telephone. If your question has been answered or you wish to withdraw, please press star followed by two. Press star one to begin.